And so we are continuing this morning, folks, for uh, as, we, as we've been doing for the last few weeks, uh, looking at disciple shift, uh, the shift that we need to make in terms of not only being disciples, but uh, making disciples. And we have been looking at life from Jesus, looking at the essence of the gospel. We then looked at last week what it meant to be uh, have life under Jesus, uh, his lordship in our life. And um, we, this week we are going to be looking at life uh, like Jesus uh, and life on life. And so we have been dealing with this in our studies through the, through the week. And I pray that you're keeping up with that. Some excellent material. I can't speak highly enough of it. It has been so uh, uh, really thought-provoking, challenging. Uh, The work by Francis Chan that we've been looking at. And also on Wednesday nights, it's been so good to be here with uh, 120-odd folk just coming together to learn more about discipleship. There's a real buzz in this in the sanctuary, and it's just really exciting. And I'm excited at where God is taking us as a church. And uh, some challenging stuff, as we said on Wednesday evening, for those of you who were part of our Wednesday night uh, inputs, uh, some really good material, you know, almost so much so that you, you, you wonder what more you can say when you listen to such great stuff. And uh, we, we're just excited to be on this journey. It is a journey. It's a process. It's not a program in any way. And when we come to the close of our input uh, here in June, we will then be coming together on a regular basis to continue this journey and to hold one another accountable for what we're doing in terms of making disciples. And so I want to just read a passage of scripture as we begin today from 2 Kings chapter 2. And you may wonder what this might have to do with discipleship, but you will find out a little later. 2 Kings chapter 2 beginning at verse 1. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied. So be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied. So be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Just so far we're going to read in that passage today. Let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer, shall we? Lord, we do thank you for another opportunity to, to spend time in your word, to reflect, to be inspired, to be challenged. And we know, Lord God, that you are calling us not only to be disciples, but to go out and make disciples. And as this challenge comes to us all, we pray that we may not just be hearers week week in and week out, that we may truly take up this great commission of going into all the world and making disciples of all nations. And so we just pray that your word would find root in our hearts today and that we might act upon it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Luke chapter 6, verse 13, we read, When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, who he also designated apostles. In John 17, verse 4, Jesus said, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. 
Jesus said this before the cross, so it's unlikely he was referring to the finished work of the cross. The work Jesus came to do was to pour his life into 12 men whom God had given to him out of the world. These men were his work. His ministry touched thousands, but his mission was focused on 12 men. He gave his life on the cross to millions, but during his earthly ministry, he devoted his time and energy to 12 men. Paul would one day say these words in 2 Timothy 2, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That is what Jesus did. He did life on life with 12 men who reproduced and reproduced and reproduced and in so doing transformed the then known world. Friends, a church that is not reproducing is a church that is dying. A disciple who is not reproducing is a disciple who is dying. He or she will take their faith and their legacy to the grave. The ultimate goal of discipleship is to reproduce disciples with the gospel. The church was never intended to be an end in itself. Rather, it was called to reproduce and fulfill the Great Commission to go and make disciples. Reproduction is the goal of every living thing. Without it, that living species becomes extinct. And if we do not reproduce, as the body of Christ, we will become extinct. It's as simple as that. The most powerful paradigm for reproducing disciples is the discipleship methodology of Jesus. In our time together on Wednesday evenings, we have had the privilege of listening to interviews with Robert Coleman, who some 40 or so years ago wrote a book called The Master Plan of Evangelism long before the church was probably ready to hear it. It's ironic that this has become almost, you know, mandatory reading for every would-be disciple of Christ now, and only the church is waking up to it. In that book, Robert Coleman wrote these words in terms of Jesus' plan of reproducing disciples. He says, It was not with programs to reach the multitudes, but with men and women whom the multitudes would follow. They were to be his method of winning the world to God. The initial objective of Jesus' plan was to enlist men and women who could bear witness to his life and carry on his work after he returned to the Father. If we are to be like Jesus, we must invest our lives in faithful men and women who will reproduce themselves in others. In his book, Robert Coleman suggests an eightfold process of training that Jesus used for his 12 disciples. And I think even though this was written some four decades ago, it is so, so relevant. And I want to spend some time looking at these focuses, these areas of training that Jesus used to train his disciples and that we ought to then use if we are to train disciples ourselves. I'm going to spend more time on the first four and then I'm just going to speak briefly to the last four. The first one is selection. Selection. The men whom Jesus chose were ordinary people. When it came time to choose those whom he had trained, he spent a night in prayer. We read, one of those days Jesus went out into the hills to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to himself and chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles. Notice what Jesus did. First of all, he prayed and asked his father to reveal to him 
who these disciples would be. He didn't just rush out and grab the first people who showed any interest. It is very much like selecting someone for a job. We all know that it's a lot easier to get somebody on the bus than to get somebody off the bus when we find out that it was the, the wrong person. Notice that none of these disciples were really the same. There were fishermen, there were tax collectors, traders, and so on. They weren't key figures in society. None of them occupied prominent places in the synagogue or the priesthood. They were impulsive, temperamental, easily offended, and had many rather unsavory character traits. They were not the disciples we might think would win the world for Christ. In fact, Acts 4 tells us that they were unlearned and ignorant men, according to the world's standards. But the one thing they all had in common was that they were willing to learn. They were teachable. And that is probably one of the most important ingredients of every disciple and every disciple maker is teachability. They were teachable, they had a yearning for God, and they had a yearning to be used by God. And we need to take our cue from Jesus, not selecting those who share our interests or are like us in our temperament and personality. We should look for those who are faithful, teachable, willing, and have the potential to reproduce their lives in others. And that is how we select disciples. We spoke about this on Wednesday. How do you choose who you are going to disciple? You need to choose people you know who are going to have influence and who are going to make an impact when they are discipled. And so we need to be identifying those folk. And we need to go out and start discipling them. We need to commit it to God in prayer and say, Lord, who do you want me to disciple? And God will show you. The second focus of Jesus' training was association. For what purpose did Jesus choose the disciples? Well, we read he appointed 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Jesus chose these men to be with him. Jesus was intimately involved in the lives of his disciples as they followed him. His training method was spending as much time as possible with each of them, which was not a revolutionary idea in the day because many disciples followed rabbis at the time. A few centuries before this, though, we saw in our reading in the Old Testament, God raised up a prophet, Elijah, who chose Elisha to help him and carry on after he was gone. Elisha found was in a field working. The disciples also were called from their daily work to go and follow Jesus. Elijah did not beg Elisha to go with him or use his prophetic office to force him against his will. Every disciple must count the cost of what it is to enter into discipleship. And they need to do so willingly. It cost Elisha something to follow Elijah. There were uncertain, these were uncertain times for any prophet or anyone associated with them in that day. There was a huge temptation for Elisha to stay with his oxen in the field, just as there must have been for Peter and Andrew to stay with their fishing nets. But Elisha was aware of the tremendous spiritual enrichment that would come if he spent time with this mighty prophet of God. And so he killed his oxen, his means of livelihood. In other words, a final total act of commitment. And he went with Elijah, and he started doing life with Elijah, life on life, day by day. To disciple someone, friends, you have to be willing to do life with them. That is what Jesus did every day with his disciples for three years. 
And that is one of the reasons why you can't spread yourself so thinly that you do not have quality time with the disciples you choose to disciple. Another lesson from Elijah is that he never coerced Elisha to continue with him in the work that he was doing. If you read the account as we did in 2 Kings, you discover that on three separate occasions, Elijah gave Elisha the possibility of getting out of the relationship, to reassess their relationship, to leave if he wanted to. And every time Elisha said, no ways, I'm going to go with you wherever you go. At Gilgal, at Bethel, at Jericho, he gave the same reply. Elisha had counted the cost and decided that this is what he wanted. And so in your choice, in your selection of men or women and your subsequent association with them, it's important to give them a way out. The last thing you need is a reluctant disciple. Another classic example given in the Old Testament is in the life of David, who watched as a ragtag, discouraged, discontented band of men joined themselves to him as he became captain over them. And after a short time, they began to change. As they did life with him, they began to change. And they became great men. Some of David's spirit rubbed off on them, and that's what discipleship is all about. And in a similar way, we should be doing life with those we are seeking to develop. We should schedule time to play, time to pray, time to have a meal, time to have a coffee. This means that discipleship will require something of you. It will require your time and your energy and your emotions. Because when you start living with people and doing life with them, you will start to share their burdens and their joys and get into their space. And your heart will break for them at times. And that will mean you becoming vulnerable as they become vulnerable. And sadly, the reason that most people most Christians do not disciple others is because they do not want to spend that time. They're too busy. It's going to cost me too much of my time. I don't have time to go and spend time with people having coffee. I want to friends. Somehow I believe that when we come before God one day, and believe me, the scriptures tell us that we will come before him, that we will come before the judgment seat of God and he will ask us to give an account of what we have done and what we haven't done. I don't think it will cut it when we say to God, sorry, I was too busy. I didn't have time to have that coffee or have that lunch or invest in any disciples' lives. It's too easy to use that as a cop-out. It's too easy to say we're just so busy we can't do it. The Great Commission was for all ages. It wasn't for 12 disciples. It's for us today. And so you need to select carefully. And then you need to associate with those people and do life with them. As Elisha and David and Jesus did. But then thirdly, what you need to do, there needs to be consecration. From the outset, when he, Jesus called his first disciples, he expected them to obey him. And likewise, he expects us to walk in obedience to his word. He sought to create in his disciples a lifestyle of consecrated obedience. And that's at the heart of true discipleship. As disciples, we need to submit and obey God's word and plan for our lives. We know how difficult that is. But ultimately, that is the goal. Jesus said, go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. That is the goal of discipleship, to teach by modeling to obey everything I've commanded. 
Each one of Jesus' disciples knew what they were in for. He said to them, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. They were totally aware of what it would cost them. Jesus prepared them to face opposition and rejection. He said to them, if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. And then in Mark chapter 8, we read he called the crowd to, to him along with his disciples and he said to them, as he says to us this morning, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? We could spend a whole series just looking at those few verses. And so when Peter here hears that Jesus is going to Jerusalem and that it's going to entail suffering, he's upset and he rebukes him. Why? Why does Peter rebuke Jesus after just declaring him to be the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God? Because he had an agenda. An agenda that led from strength to strength. An agenda that basically said that Jesus was coming to deliver them from the hand of Rome. The Messiah was come to deliver them. The Messiah was not coming to suffer and to die on a cross. And I want to say, friends, if your agenda is the end and Jesus is the means, you are using God. If Jesus is truly the Lord of your life, you cannot make him the means to an end. You cannot make him the means to happiness and joy and fulfillment and prosperity and a new job and whatever it is. You don't come before a king and negotiate. You don't come before a king and say, I'll obey you if. There's no such thing as an if when you come before a king. You do as the king commands you to do. And as we said last week, Jesus was not a king on a throne. He was a king on a cross. If you were on a throne, you would submit to him just because you had to. But because he's a king on a cross, you submit to him out of love and out of trust. You don't come to him negotiating. You don't come to him saying, Lord, if. You say, Lord, whatever you ask, I will do. And when someone gives themselves so utterly for you as Jesus did, how can you not give but everything to him. The great commission is not the great option. It's not the great suggestion. It's the great command. We need to consecrate ourselves before God. We need to obey him and teach others to do likewise. Then the four, fourth focus is demonstration. How did Jesus demonstrate a life of obedience? Jesus asked his disciples to follow him and in doing so he invited them to see a living example of a disciple. It was always a live demonstration of what he was teaching. This was true of everything in his life. This was the reason that he had such a lasting impact on his disciples is that he lived the message before them daily. He was the, the message and the method. By walking with Jesus, they saw how he lived his faith in the real world. 
For example, with prayer, often the disciples would notice Jesus going out alone into the desert or on a mountain to pray. And they observed that he put time aside to pray to his father, even though he was the Messiah. And so one day when he came down from the mountain, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. We've seen you doing it, now teach us to pray. It wasn't a book they read. It was a living demonstration of prayer. The same is true of Scripture. About 166 times Jesus quoted the Old Testament passages and the disciples realized that he was really living by it. He not only knew what was written, but he knew what it meant and how it related to real life situations. They witnessed how he showed compassion, how he healed the sick, opening the eyes of the blind, casting out demons. They learned what it meant to have a passion for souls. He wept over Jerusalem. He had a passion for lost and hurting people. And as they saw that in him, and as he demonstrated that to them, they themselves started to get a passion for souls. At least 35 separate incidents record how Jesus was involved in some, in some way, life on life, with individuals, not with masses of people, with individuals. Think of the women at the well. Think of Zacchaeus, he called down from the tree. Think of the women who, who knelt before him and broke a, a, a jar of perfume over his feet. Over and over again, he met with individuals. He did life with individuals. He demonstrated love. He didn't just talk about it from a book. Friends, we need to practice what we preach because the people we train, the people we disciple are looking at us and they want to follow our life and our example. Does that mean you've got to be perfect? Absolutely not. Does that mean you've got to be so far in the journey that others can follow? Absolutely not. What you've got to be, as we said on Wednesday, is you've got to be absolutely authentic. You've got to be real. People need to see that you are real. People have to see that you're not wearing a mask. It's no good being a, a disciple maker and being all holier than thou when you're with your disciple and then going behind their back and doing things that nobody would, would think of doing as a Christian. It's taking off your mask. It's being vulnerable. It's acknowledging your blind spots, that they're actually faults and, and areas of your life that need a change. And sometimes your disciple disciples you as the disciple maker. We've got to live a life worthy of others to follow. And we know how challenging that is. That's scary because it makes us vulnerable. And I don't think there's probably one of us here this morning who feels adequate at doing that because we've kind of got to be real. We've got to actually show people that we, we also worry and we're also anxious about things out there and we, we also mess up and we also have wrong thoughts that we think of and, and so on. And when others start to realize that we're actually authentic, that we're still in Christ, that's when that excuse that the world gives for, for not believing in Christ and Christianity, that the church is filled with hypocrites, that's when that excuse starts to fall away. And they see actually... The guy who's discipling me is so genuine because I know more about his faults and weaknesses than he probably knows about mine. And that's what discipleship is all about. We need to be authentic. Demonstration. Now let me just go through the last four very quickly. And yet they are as equally as important as the first four. Delegation. Delegation. Jesus assigned his disciples to work. He developed his disciples by delegating ministry responsibilities to them. He sent his disciples out and gave them real ministry, hands on hand, hands on experience is a vital, was a vital part of Jesus' training method, his discipleship curriculum, as it were. 
As a church, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. What does that mean? That every single one of us is called to minister, is called to serve, is called to get involved in the kingdom of God. And still, our church is filled with people who don't. I want to say, friends, there's no better way than growing in your own faith and your walk with God than serving and ministering and sharing the gospel. I think back to when I first came to Christ in 1978 at university and how in our church we had a disciple maker and how he sent us out into, into Hillbrow. And every Friday night we'd go there and we'd stand on street corners and we'd share the gospel and hand out tracts and speak to Hare Krishnas as they gathered in High Point in Hillbrow. And as people came out of the movie, movie theaters and we would talk to them and we'd proclaim God's word to them. And I can tell you, there's nothing in my Christian experience, no amount of teaching, no amount of sermons, anything that I've ever heard or read that did more for my faith than that. We used to go to Joburg Gen Hospital and hand out tracts and, and pray over people, people, strangers, from bed to bed for a whole night in the middle of the week. And I used to come back to my room and I wanted to literally bang on every door in that block of flats and tell people about Jesus. I wanted to tell them what an amazing experience we just had. We had had people who were healed, people who came to Christ with tears in their eyes. It was amazing. And I think to myself, that is what really cemented my faith in Jesus and made him real. I've said it before, I would never have left my career as an engineer to go into ministry just preaching religion. It's life, friends. It's living, vital life in Jesus. And we need to delegate those we disciple and say, the best way you can grow is to get involved, share your faith with somebody else. Because there's nothing that makes your faith come alive than when you actually share it with somebody else. The next word that Robert Coleman suggests is supervision, which is so important. Jesus supervised his disciples. Whenever he re they returned from a mission trip or a ministry trip, they would report to him. And this allowed time for the disciples to reflect, to review, and receive instruction from Jesus. When people start out on the road of discipleship, they face issues that they they've never confronted before. We call it on-the-job training. They learn as they go. And that requires supervision from someone who, who's already walked that path, who can maybe advise and help them along the way. Jesus continually was checking in with his disciples, seeing how they were coming along, asking insightful questions. He sent 72 out and they came back and said, we had a great time. Even demons submitted to us. And he used that occasion to teach them something about the Holy Spirit. I want to say too, here what's really important is celebration. Part of your supervision is to celebrate with your disciple, the person who's following you, and to say when they've gained a victory in some area of their life over sin or over a habit or whatever it is, to celebrate with them, to rejoice with them. When they've had a breakthrough and they've managed to pray for the first time, to, to celebrate with them. When they've witnessed for the first time and they come back and share with you, to celebrate with them. Supervision is an important part of leadership development especially when you deal with new believers. We want to delegate and empower people to act, but we also need to supervise them to make sure they're on track. That doesn't mean micromanagement, and it also doesn't mean just hands off. It means journeying with them and allowing them to share when they feel ready to share. Are you still with me? Yeah. We're going on to number seven. Very briefly, we've spent a lot of time on number seven already, reproduction. Just to reiterate, Jesus expected his disciples to reproduce his likeness in others. 
He imparted his message and mission to his disciples so that they would reproduce themselves in others and make disciples of all nations. The Great Commission implies that the followers of Jesus will reproduce themselves and make disciples. It's how the Christian movement was born. It's why we are here today. As we said earlier on, all living things reproduce. If they don't, they become extinct. We will die if we do not reproduce. Our church will die if we do not reproduce. And then the last focus is impartation. Jesus told his disciples before he left them, you will be filled when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will have power and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit throughout his, his ministry because he knew that he would leave, send the Holy Spirit to his church and that without the Holy Spirit they would not be able to fulfill the Great Commission. And I want to say, friends, we cannot do this in our own flesh. And I think my concern when I hear so many saying, well, this is really tough, I don't know if I can do this, I want to say, Perhaps that's because we're not relying on God's Spirit to do it in us. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We can do anything if the Holy Spirit infuses us and imparts life and power to us. We can boldly go out and make disciples. Not in our own strength in, in the flesh, but we can in the power of God's Spirit. I think those four, eight focuses of Jesus' training methodology, as it were, are so vital for us today. My prayer, friends, is that you will take those notes and actually use them. I said at the early service, don't take notes away and shove them in a Bible or a book or leave them around the house and they just, you know, are useless. I really urge you to get some kind of discipline going in your life and put them in a folder or file, even if you say sermons, and keep them there. So in your devotions, you can go back to what God is saying to you. So let's just recap on those eight areas. Number one, select. Select those who are willing, those who are faithful, those who will go out and reproduce. Association. Associate with those, not the people who, who are like you, but those that God puts across your path who fulfill number one. Consecration, obedience to God's word, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Demonstration, demonstrate life on life that you might be a demonstration of God's love and that people will want to follow you because of your authenticity. Delegate folk to get involved in, in ministry and witnessing and prayer and so on. Supervise them. Don't just leave them on their own. Supervise them. Meet with them regularly to find out how they're doing and what obstacles they're encountering. Reproduce. Reproduce your life in them and get them to reproduce their lives in others. And then the impartation of the Spirit. Realize that you cannot do this in your own strength. You've got to rely on the Spirit of God to fill you and to empower you to do His work. Now, I know some folk would be saying, well, that's easier said than done. You know, that, that's great, but it's really difficult to do this. I, I don't know who to select. I don't know who's out there. I don't, know, I don't feel adequate. Friends, in your weakness... He is strong. Trust Jesus. Pray like Jesus did and say, Lord, help me to cross paths with someone who I can disciple. Many of you are working and you've got guys just down the hall from you, down the passage from you, people you can disciple. This is not going to end, as I said on Wednesday night. This is not a series we're going through that's going to end. This nightmare, in inverted commas, is going to carry on for a long, long time until the day you die or until you move church. <laughs> so if you don't like it, then maybe, you know, if you move church, then you won't be as uncomfortable. But folks, that's what Jesus called us 
to be his disciples and to be disciple makers. And it's not a program, it's a process. And we're going to be revisiting it over and over again because it's so vital. And I know that as you start doing it, you're going to get so excited that you're doing it. And you're going to get so challenged and, 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 and grow so much in your own devotions and in your own walk with God that you, you're not going to stop. You're going to just carry on. And you're going to tell others to carry on because that's what, it, that's, that's, that's what happened with the first 12 disciples. So let's, let's pray. Let's really pray that God would show us who we can disciple. Let's be the disciple makers God wants us to be. Amen? Let's bow in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your word and thank you for this, this process of, of training and making disciples. It, it is daunting. It is challenging. It is, we feel so inadequate, Lord, but we, we ask that you would infuse us with your spirit and enable us to, to go and do what you've called us to do. That we may not make excuses, that we don't have time and we, we barely get to spend time with our families and, 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 and all these, these excuses that we give. Lord, may we make time to do the most important thing you've called us to do, and that is to, to live life with others in informal ways and, and sometimes in more formal ways, so that they in turn may reproduce and reproduce and that we might transform the world around us. And so thank you for your word, Lord, and just continue to write it in our hearts for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All the Lord's people said... And when I was speaking to the early congregation and I was asking for amens, it was like a muffled hush. Now, I don't know if it was just coming from a heart of real trepidation and, and anxiety as to what God was calling them to do. But if you kind of feeling that, those kind of tingling nerves and, gee, I'm not sure if I can do this, that's wonderful because that's God's spirit basically speaking to you and saying, step up to the plate. This is what I've called you to do. Okay, we're going to do that, eh? We're going to do that. We're going to reproduce and be a reproducing church for God's glory. Let's sing as we close this morning. Let's stand and sing together. <laughs>